Hi! Welcome to this part of my multi-part review of Vampire the Masquerade 20th Anniversary Edition Core Book. This time I'm going to talk about the Simitsi and the Ventru clans. These two clans are amongst my favorite of the vampire clans. I've already talked about the Bruja and the Gangrel, but, but the Simitsi and the Ventru, they feel um, like they took great inspiration from Dracula. They have that air of dark nobility to them that they feel elegant, refined and monstrous at the same time. They're also pretty good at scheming and manipulating others. So the, they really have a strong sense of the archetypical uh, vampire villain or perhaps dark hero, it depends. Now let's start with the Simitsi. Let's talk about the art first. I don't like the new illustration at all. As you can see, I really dislike most of the art in this core book because just take a look at the old version of the art. It looks it looks really cool. This character she looks like a, like a predator. You don't you're not exactly sure if she's going to invite you uh, to her mansion for for tea or I guess blood or bite or if she's going to pounce at you right away if she's going to attack you right there and, and then. And if we take a look at the new version of the art, mm, well, she looks like she expresses that alien or monstrous uh, aspect of the Sumitsi, uh, the way that they play around with flesh and bone by manipulating their, their bodies, uh, changing and shaping their, their shape. But look at uh, her expression, it's just so... Uh, like... harmless, but not harmless as if she's trying to trick you into lowering your guard. She, this, the expression is awful, in my opinion. She looks so unthreatening when compared to the other. This illustration of the Simitsi looks so powerful, so predatory. Well... The Simitsi vampires feel a bit out of place in modern nights. It's like they wanted to keep things or preserve things the way that it was handled in Vampire the Dark Age. They are powerful aristocrats. They are also quite cunning and very bold in, in whatever they have to do to gain the upper hand over other vampires. There is a rumor that they actually killed their progenitor, their antediluvian. There is a, a funny detail that Marco from Multiversal Dystopico mentioned. I'm going to put a link to his channel below. He said that if you um, pay attention, you will see that many of the vampires that, or the vampire clans, that did something against the antediluvians, they kind of get like a karmic backlash or something really bad happens to them, and the Smiths here are no exception. After killing their antediluvian, they fell into decadence because they came into conflict with the... Uh, what was the name? Uh, the Tremere vampires that I covered in, my, in the previous part of this review. And they also weren't good friends with the, for example, the Ventru, because the Simitsi, as uh, haughty or arrogant nobles, they wanted to always be on top of things, and they did not care uh, of hiding their presence from mortals. They didn't care about that at all. So in their struggle to remain on top of things, of not trying to do what it, what it takes to survive, of uh, keeping a low profile, the clan took quite a blow. Luckily for them, they are, besides that, despite that, they are quite intelligent and skilled in battle, especially because of one of their uh, disciplines, perhaps one of the strangest dis vampire disciplines in the game, which is uh, vicissitude. This allows them to twist and shape their bone and, and their flesh. They manipulate all sorts of parts of their bodies and if needed they can become really fearsome in battle they can cover themselves with spike uh, reinforce certain vulnerable areas 
uh, they can uh, develop a large or shape large claws and fangs and they have many monstrous features they are also somewhat let's say elitistic or uh, elites when it comes to uh, choosing who they embrace they have like a family of humans that they immediately turn into ghouls and depending on the purpose of these ghouls they actually go uh, at great lengths to turn them into complete killing machines into complete monsters that is many of their ghouls have uh, multiple uh, mouths or maws and jaws and hands and they, they're true aberrations and those ghouls that the Tzimitzi consider uh, worthy they turn to um, complete members of, of, of the Tzimitzi clan the Tzimitzi are quite alien not only in their appearance because of the flesh crafting process but also in their methodology and, and they have like this mad scientist reasoning they will go at great lengths and they will break all taboos to try to achieve a sense of um, perhaps you could say monstrous or alien perfection they experiment with everything and everyone they test the limits of the physical bodies of their victims or the subjects but also of their minds they also experiment dealing pain something quite particular of the Sumitsi is that they are quite Mm, hospitable or good hosts. If a Simitsi invites you to their house or their mansion, their castle, it, uh, you can rest assured that they will protect you the entire time uh, while you are getting there and while, while they have you in the premises of the location. But uh, once the invitation is over, then they uh, can be terrifying opponents. They're also quite cruel with those that invade their mansions, their homes, their havens. So they have a really, really strange sense of, let's say, diplomacy or hospitality. The Simitsi are well organized, but sometimes they want to get on top even uh, uh, over other members of their own clan so this perhaps keeps them from being a greater power than they were before perhaps it was because of the presence of their original progenitor that the clan became so powerful during the uh, dark ages but later on the uh, when they killed they decided to kill this antediluvian they fell a, a bit out of organization, out of place, and that's why they felt so driven to, to fortify the Sabbat, because this sect, because it hates uh, humanity, and, uh, or, or rather, it doesn't treat humanity as equals, rather like cattle. They uh, try to shape the path of the Sabbat towards a way of existence where the Semitsi rule over all others. In fact, even though they work with the um, La Sombra, you kind of get the sense that they will probably try to uh, backstab or get rid of the La Sombra uh, once they reach the top. Uh, who is to know how these uh, alien scientists think? The Smitsi are quite unfathomable in their intelligence, in their thought process. Their appearances could be quite beautiful or quite nightmarish. It depends on what a particular Simitsi vampire is trying to express. Because there are some that reach for uh, perfection. It wouldn't be uncommon in modern nights for a, a let's say, a Simitsi to, to play the part of a model of a really beautiful person by uh, getting rid of all sorts of wrinkles and uh, trying to achieve a, per a perfect visage of of beauty but if the Simitsi is so inclined uh, that vampire could also turn his entire body into the archetypical vampire monster like with wings and and spikes and claws and giant fangs there is actually the highest aspects of the to discipline actually turns you into uh, uh, the seemingly demonic form their havens are also quite difficult to pinpoint as the, the, the saying that they look in a certain way but all of them feel a bit monastic or religious 
they feel like um, a cult gathering of sorts and they sometimes desire to um, take refuge in mausoleums or sometimes in hospitals and morgues and sometimes in very elegant places or perhaps decadent castles. In fact, the, the Smitsi would be the first clan to take refuge in the typical vampire castle um, built upon uh, like a cliff. So they are quite classical in that aspect when it comes to classic horror. The Smitsi are also quite paranoid. Their wars against different vampire clans, especially the Tremere, they, they have left them a bit shattered in their organization. But they still uh, try to cultivate and embrace those that have high intelligence, uh, very strong willpower, and that are not afraid of embracing change in one way or another because it takes a very powerful mind to suddenly uh, transform your entire body into something completely monstrous without uh, com uh, losing complete control of, of your sanity or what is left of it. Their clan disciplines are animalism, aspects, and vicissitude, as I was saying, so they also feed the classical vampire stereotype in that, or archetype perhaps, in that they can control animals, they can sense many things, and because of their vicissitude, at times they can feel a bit like a Castlevania villain, like a Dracula from Castlevania, as many of you know, in uh, different games he turns into this like a hideous demonic vampire of sorts, like he says something like, grant me power or something, and he turns into this huge bat monster or whatever, the, the Smitsi are known for attaining this uh, Sulu shape or something even more horrible. When it comes to their weaknesses, just like Dracula, they need to um, rest where there is at least uh, two handfuls of native soil. So when they are moving around, they're usually carrying around uh, some part of the ground where that it was of great importance to them. Maybe it was their birthplace or the place where they were embraced by another vampire. It has to be a place of great significance. If they do not take these two handfuls of native soil, they become quite weak as, the, as they um, progressively sleeping in other, taking refuge in other places without that native soil. So the Smitsi are still trying to find their place in modern nights. And rather than adapting to modern nights, they try to shape the world uh, back into a state where vampires ruled over humans, like in those uh, classic horror tales. When it comes to the stereotypes that they have of other clans, they are quite arrogant and they do not consider, they basically consider no vampire clan their equal. Perhaps they have a, like a bit of a grudging respect for some of them, but let me read some of the things that they think of other clans. For example, the Bruja. They plunged themselves into ruin millennia ago and continue to blame others for their own failures. So, uh, as you can see, they perhaps once they consider the Bruja a bit at their level because they, but because they do not feel as philosophical as before, they no longer respect them as much. Or, or if they respect them at all, it's not evident. And, uh, for example, their partners in crime, the La Sombra, they say, competent, mostly. But as you can see, they're still not considering the La Sombra like worthy partners. Or, for example, the, some vampires, they completely loathe them, perhaps because they don't have the highest opinions of them. Because, for example, if I'm not mistaken, the Malkavian uh, think that the Semitsi are, are a bit insane as well. And it's funny because many of you know that the Malkavian are the, some of the craziest vampires in existence if, not, existence, if not the craziest vampires. So the Malkavian actually think that the Semitsi are even worse because uh, how can someone, let's say, deform his or her own body in such alien ways? So of the Malkavian, the Semitsi say, they are suitable for making lampshades from their remains. <laughs> and of the Ventru, they say, we have warred for so long that they are due a grudging respect before you snuff their heart's fire. So as you can see, that's the top of, what, of when it comes to, to the respect that a Smitsi can uh, show or express for other vampire clans. They're also somewhat hopeful that the Gangrel 
uh, will return to them. It's not so evident in this core book, but in the older edition, uh, they kind of want to become allies of the Gangrel because in ages past, the Semitsi and the Gangrel uh, fought together against the Tremir. But it was with the formation of the Camarilla that they split, even though there are some Gangrel in, in uh, the Sabbat sect. And most of the Gangrel are with the Camarilla. But the Semitsi are still trying to, um, let's say, recover them as shock troops. Now let's talk about the Ventru. I really like the new art. This is probably my favorite illustration of the 20th anniversary uh, art when it comes to the clans uh, uh, representing, a, let's say, an archetypical member of a clan. Because just take a look at this guy. He's, he looks so elegant, but at the same time so devious, like he's scheming something. And he just it, it looks like he just killed someone. Or maybe he just had a drink, who knows, but his hand is all bloody and he's about to clean himself up. He's kind of like, oh, I don't want to get my clothes dirty. So he has that uh, high-class elegance aura to him. And take a look at this uh, older version of the artwork. It's still pretty good. It's also, it looks sharp and elegant. But I still like the, the new one quite a bit. It just it says Ventru all over it. Now, so who are the Ventru? The Ventru are the leaders of the Camarilla. They established the Camarilla. They immediately noticed in uh, the older nights that uh, vampires were in danger of disappearing, and they had many enemies. They fought against each other, and they also had humans, human enemies. So they decided to form the Camarilla, a way for vampires to carry out this sort of like a covert civilization where they remain hidden from, from humans, as many of you know. Oh, that's why it's called Vampire the Masquerade, of course. Mm, but the Ventru, I feel that they have a, a very interesting parallel relationship with the Bruja. For the most part, the clans are, are they, both clans are clashing. They work together for the survival of the kindred, but uh, as I said in my... A review of the Bruja. The Bruja blamed the Ventru because the once uh, the Bruja had what their idea of the perfect vampire society in Carthage, where they uh, lived in harmony with humans, taking a bit of blood from them but not killing them. And then the Ventru leaving Rome, they destroyed Carthage. So um, the Bruja were quite. Um, they want revenge because of that. They think that the Ventru were envious of their perfect society. But the Bentru at the same time countered that if it was such a perfect society, what, why did you get, they would tell the Bruja, why would you get defeated in the, in the first place? If you have something good going on, then it was actually weak or, or flawed because it was defeated, it was destroyed. So there isn't like um, good blood for the most part between the Bentru and the Bruja. But at the same time, in some of the vampire books, um, well, I think it was just one book and, and, and a video game. You can see some really powerful friendships and enmities between the Ventru and the Bruja. In one of the video games, and I'm, going to, I'm not going to say which one so to avoid spoilers, but there you can see a really powerful enmity between a Bruja and a Ventru across the uh, centuries. Uh, but in a vampire novel, you can see a very strong friendship between a member of the Ventru clan and um, the Bruja clan. Uh, it was uh, quite evident from the start. And so it goes to show that there is a lot of chemistry be between Ventru and the Bruja. They're, the way that both clans have developed, it's also quite interesting because the Ventru in the past, when they were uh, kings and queens and knights and conquerors, because they usually took to the battlefield, it was quite... Um, usual or expected to see a Ventru with very high physical attributes. But in modern times, that is not uh, as needed because of modern technology and weapons. So the Ventru in modern nights, they are more socially inclined and in, are more intelligent in their development rather than uh, f focusing on physical training. And the Bruja happened, uh, in, what would you say, in contrast or the other way around. The Bruja at first were quite mentally inclined and not as physical. 
But in modern nights, <laughs> they have turned completely, almost completely physical or martial and with some high attributes in reasoning, because after all, they have to keep that archetype of the philosopher warrior. But they seem uh, uh, like they form a very strong contrast with the Ventru in that regard. The Ventru consider themselves the best of the best. They only embrace the best that humanity has to offer. They take the most elegant, the most refined, the most intelligent, the most charismatic. Uh, some of, sometimes they choose particular families to embrace from them. But if they also spot some, let's say, diamond in the rough, some hidden talent, they will also embrace that. They consider themselves the kings, uh, the rulers of the masquerade. Uh, they uphold vampire civilization. And because of that, they are also at the center of many conspiracies and schemes and plans. The Ventru are uh, a bit like the puppet masters, but that also means that there is a lot of uh, backstabbing at times within the clan. Sometimes an upstart they they tries to, to kill one of the elders, and that is usually frowned upon unless the upstart succeeds. So uh, you can see a bit how the Ventru get along. So this is one of the most organized clans, of course, especially because they feel like they have to shoulder the entire weight of the Camarilla. They are also quite stylish in the way that they look. They're always dressed uh, quite proper and neat. They are not as, let's say, as flamboyant or as spectacular or as stunning as the... Um, the... Uh, ah. I forgot the name, sorry. Toriador! Yes, as a Toriador. But Ventru, if you see a Ventru a bit just slightly scruffy with a hair out of place or with perhaps his sleeve uh, rolled in a weird way, it was probably because the Ventru was recently fighting someone. So they, they care about appearance a lot. And their place of ref refuge, their haven, it always looks so opulent and grandiose. They are very magnificent places fit uh, for an emperor. They, they uh, like to stay in places that express their sense of, of ruling over the entire uh, Camarilla or the kindred. Excuse me. Hello? No, you keep those followers upset from getting to the next Primogen Council, or I will destroy your little Paris Canacom's operation. I'm sorry. So, as I was saying, they consider their havens uh, an extension of, of their uh, magnificence. Ventru excel at social attributes and ways in which they communicate with others, they're, they express their plans, their ideas, and they carry them out. But this also means that the Ventru have to dominate other at, others at times. Their clan disciplines are dominate, fortitude, and presence, and these three disciplines help them a lot in trying to make uh, others do what they want for the better of uh, the Camarilla of Vampire Society, or what they consider is the best, because uh, sometimes it's actually there's a selfish purpose behind it all. So through domination, they turn others into their puppets. Through fortitude, they can resist many assassination attempts, they are able to withstand uh, uh, aggravated damage from supernatural means or even uh, getting burned by the sun. And with their presence, they manage to attract or repel whoever they like. So even though they are not well suited for combat, they have some ways to enforce their will upon others. Their weakness is quite strange when compared to the weaknesses of other vampire clans. They are basically, they have rarefied tastes. They can only drink blood from a specific type of mortal. Maybe they can only drink blood from nuns, or from albinos, or from um, women on, under 20 years, or perhaps only older men. They all have a, each Ventru has a particular taste, and they have to, to take blood from that uh, particular individual, otherwise they do not uh, gain their vitae back. They're, they cannot fuel their vampire powers. So, and, and they have a bit of a difficulty when um, 
moving around places. When a Ventru takes control of a certain sector in a city, they make sure that they have an ample supply of that particular individual, or they even go to great lengths, uh, great lengths to, uh, let's say, receive shipments from the particular blood, and that's quite troublesome. But this is also, a, a, let's say, not as difficult as it may seem, because considering the Ventru have many contacts and influence, almost everything is within the reach of the Ventru, and because of their dealings with both vampires and mortals, and because of the way they uh, have ghouls that serve them, it's not uncommon to have different vintages of blood or different people uh, suited for their tastes, some that they give blood willingly for the, in exchange for the Ventrus' uh, power and, and so a portion of their power, money, influence, etc. Now when it comes to the stereotypes of what the Ventru think of other clans, they're also quite... They, they simply think that the other clans cannot measure up to them. Perhaps they show a bit, just a bit of respect for some of them, not, but when compared to the opinions of other clans, the Ventru uh, truly believe that they are the best of the best. Because, for example, <laughs> of the Bruja, they say, just admit you're beaten and this will become much more pleasant. <laughs> or followers of Set, when you learn of them in your domain, do not hesitate to introduce them to their master, the Sun. <laughs> or uh, then uh, about the Nosferatu, surprisingly functional. Should you be able to handle their odious personalities and overestimation of their own value? Perhaps they feel a bit threatened by the Nosferatu at times because, as I said in my review of the Nosferatu, they have like this underground sewer kingdom, so maybe they feel like they, they are a bit out of their reach at times. And of the Toreador, I'm uh, pleased that they still show, let's say, some uh, friendship towards them, uh, in contrast with the Toreador in this core book, they show the Toreador as if they are spiteful of the Ventru, but the Ventru here, they still show that uh, sense of alliance with the Toreador. They say, for every queen, for every, sorry, for every king there is a queen, and there are a lot of queens among the ranks of the Rose Clan. So, um, you could say that they are, they like the Toreador, but at the same time that sounds a bit like, <laughs> like they make them fall into certain stereotypes. And, uh, for example, of the Simitsi, that they are the, some of like their long-time rivals at times, because the Ventru, because they fought since the Crusades, they have some long-standing enmities. With the Asamites, because they came from the Middle East and they started attacking, they get trying to go into the West, they have that rivalry with the Asamites. And with the Simitsi, they say, what more do you need than their cloying scent of corruption to know that theirs is an ill presence? So, as you can see, a really arrogant clan, but despite that, many vampires have to turn to them in search of help or refuge. So, what do I think of these two clans, the Smitsi and the Ventru? These are two of my favorite clans. They, they are so manipulative and dark. When it comes to Vampire the Masquerade, the Smitsi and the Ventru are pulling the strings in many times. And because uh, they come from those clans that feel like old money or that uh, they have a certain hierarchy, they are constantly trying to prove themselves to their elders. So you can create some really exciting and complicated adventures or stories, sorry, some entire chronicles uh, built around the objectives of the Simitsi and the Ventru. It's very difficult to get them together in a group or in a, a coterie because they're always, the Simitsi and the, and the Ventru are always trying to get on top of things and only one can stand at the top of the, of the hill or the mountain, I guess you could say. Maybe there is a way to uh, work it out because the, there is, a, the Simitsi have a, a very small, very small presence outside of the Sabbath. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, moving on their own, or perhaps they're, they're every now and then you could insert a Simitsi in the Camarilla, but that's really strange, but unusual. So there could be some ways to twist uh, the Chronicle in a way that the Simitsi and the Ventru are actually working together and not just, not the clans, the clans hate each other, or at least are consider themselves rivals, 
but at least you can get one or two vampires working together, one Ventru and a Simitsi. It's still quite difficult, but overall, awesome clans. Uh, I, I love them quite a bit. I love their uh, sense of character and their sense of monstrous refinement. And I uh, think that having just one of these clans in, in your chronicle can serve as a, as a vortex to move things around in any direction, uh, be it uh, political or being it, uh, exploring some aspects of the apocalypse that is looming because of the antediluvians and Cain and such. There is something really um, big going on every time the Sumitsi and the Ventru are involved. Well, uh, thanks for watching this part of my review. If you have any comments or questions, please let me know. See you later.